All right, everyone, welcome back to the Home to Self podcast. I am joined today by a good friend of mine, Kelsey Wakefield, who I met in Chico, California, back when I lived there a few years ago. We were actually neighbors. We lived in the same apartment complex, and our paths crossed, and we realized that we had so many you know, similarities, so many things in common, especially health and fitness, which we were both really into and still are today. Mm-hmm. Kelsey's actually a realtor, so your zone of genius is all about you know, selling homes and all of that good stuff. So I actually do recommend everyone go follow Kelsey. I'll include all of her info below because I've learned so much. And I don't know if there's anyone that can make real estate fun or like interesting, I think it's you. So there's that, but we're not actually going to talk about real estate today. (laughs) We are talking ever for me. I know, right? You're talking about something completely different, but I know that health and wellness is such a passion of yours as well. And we really do have so many similar perspectives and just views on health nowadays than, you know, a lot of other people. And so I thought that we would just have a really authentic, open conversation about our individual health journeys and what we've learned along the way. Because It's been a roller coaster. I know that we've both had our ups and downs um, and so much that we've learned along the way. And so I was like, why not just bring you on the show and let's just talk a little bit as we would normally, but hit record so that other people can enjoy this conversation as well. Maybe get a couple of nuggets out of it. So first and foremost, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I'm super excited. I've never, I have a real estate podcast, but I've never done a podcast on health and, and wellness, even though, like you said, that's my other passion. And Like all of the podcasts in my library are health and wellness or real estate. (laughs) So I think this is very aligned for me and I'm really, really excited. And honestly, I fully credit you and like the beginning of our friendship with why I started a wellness journey because I knew nothing when I met you. I was um, working at a gym. So that was as, you know, much exercise knowledge as I had. And I almost had no knowledge about nutrition when I met you. So definitely the universe or whatever put us in each other's lives for a good reason. And I just want to say thanks for launching my wellness journey with all its roller coasters. (laughs) That's so exciting. I didn't actually know that, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was divine. You know, we came together and you knew about this gym in motion and I didn't have a gym membership. I needed a little workout buddy. And then I knew a lot about nutrition and whatnot. And our worlds just collided and it was so fun to like explore that deeper with you. And yeah, I mean, I guess let's jump right into it. I would love to ask you a little bit more about like the start of your health and wellness journey. I mean, was that really the beginning or did you, I know you had some issues with your health earlier on in life. I don't know if you, if that was part of like what, um, you know, interested you in like getting healthy and whatnot, but just share whatever you want in terms of like where you were when you started becoming interested in this field. Okay. So honestly, I didn't have any major issues. I mean, I always had, I'm really into just to preface like women's health in particular. And I've always had like menstrual cramps, but I didn't have horrible periods. I never struggled with endometriosis or anything like that. Um, my doctor put my periods were always irregular. So of course my OBGYN was like, let's get you on birth control. That'll regulate you. Well, it didn't regulate me. I just stopped getting a period because I didn't want to. And they said, it's perfectly safe. So I did not, um, I, I was on a birth control for a long time. Like that was, I think freshman year of college all the way to post-college. I'm gosh, probably what is that? Five, six, six or seven years. And when I got out of college, I started to gain weight, which I had never struggled with before. I was one of those lucky ones who I could do whatever I wanted. I didn't exercise. I ate whatever, and I didn't struggle with my weight. And then all of a sudden I was, uh, to be honest, going out a lot more. And that was kind of when you were in my life. Like when we met, I was starting to go out a lot more. I didn't have a boyfriend. Like I was just, let's meet people and drink and whatever. So 
that's what started me on my exercise journey was I knew that after you're in your like, you know, mid twenties, whatever it's, it, you can easily gain weight and your metabolism changes and all that stuff. So anyways, I started working at in motion, started going to the gym more, but obviously I always knew that there was a large nutrition piece. I think I have a somewhat of a good example from my mom, not my dad for what nutrition looks like. Some good, some, some, bad things that were left over from her growing up in the seventies. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's what really, unfortunately the weight gain was what started my health journey. But once I think it was also like divine intervention in a way that I discovered this passion within me for it and a passion to also help. And I just like to help others and everything, but especially in wellness and in real estate and that. I guess you get more and more and more information and you get deeper, deeper, deeper into it. And then you start to discover what works for you. And I just loved, I loved the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, weight gain is the entry point for so many people. And I know for me, it was a big factor as well. Like you Mm -hmm. said, after college, I mean, I gained weight in college because I was partying a lot and whatnot, but it continued a little bit out of college too. And you know, we were young, we were having fun and it's all part of the mm-hmm. the journey. But at some point you do realize that like, oh, maybe I should think about my health and fitness a little bit more because my body isn't operating the same way it did when I was younger. <laughs> and so it's like that, like light bulb moment of like, oh, okay. Like, I guess I have to put some effort into this. Yeah. Um, but before we go any further, I do want to preface this by saying that you know, everything that Kelsey and I are going to share today is completely like our personal experiences and lessons that we've learned. And we are not sharing this to like give any sort of like advice on what you should do. This is, you know, the more that I learned about nutrition and health and fitness and all these things, the more that I'm actually like humbled and like just more cautious about what I say and, and the advice I give, because it is such a complex topic. And I know for myself following a lot of different influencers and and fitness people and you know the social media space is just so saturated with people who like are just spewing so much information and you know um just swearing by different diets and programs and things and I fell into that trap a lot and was just very vulnerable when I didn't know any better and it can do more harm than good so before anything like please just always make sure that you do your own research and at the end of the day just like trust your own intuition and like what you feel called to try or not try and like take everything with a grain of salt very important to put that out there at the beginning because this topic is just can be really triggering it can be a lot yeah it can be a lot there's a lot of information out there and i think that everyone's and you and i talk about this like everyone's health journey is their own and what works for one person may not work for another. Everybody's bodies are different. So it's a very individualistic journey for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So from there, you know, we got into, so I had after college, just to put things kind of give context to my story as well. You know, I also wanted to lose weight and like look better. It was more about the physical. And so I started, you know, working out more and that got me into nutrition. I'd been very interested in nutrition because of my mom and, um, just the background that I grew up with. And so I was cooking for myself and like learning more and more. And, you know, one thing brings you to another and, um, suddenly you're just like obsessed with this. feels like you can't ever get enough. (laughs) And, um, when we moved to Chico and I met you, I started actually like working out more in a way that was more like specific to strength training, which was something Mm -hmm. that like, actually like you inspired me to do, um, and gain more confidence in the gym. So that was really fun as well. And I mean, we were at this point, I think just really having fun with it. And that's something to point out because at least for me over my, when I look back at like my entire health and wellness journey over the past, like four ish, five ish years, it like, it started getting more and more serious and more and more like, I don't know. I just lost the joy that I had at the beginning because I was like more concerned with all the details and the calories and the things. And it's just an interesting trap that you can get trapped in. And so yeah. I think when I, where I want to take it next is what we have tried, or at least some of the things, because I know we've both explored and experimented a lot in this space. And I think there's something really good about that. You know, like you should experiment to a certain degree yeah. to see what works and what doesn't for you. 
However, it's really easy to take it too far. Um, So what are some of the diets or like programs or routines or whatever that you try that you can remember? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really good to try different things and it leads you to where you want to be and you can also cross things off your list of like, I tried that, glad it works for you, doesn't work for me and you can kind of stand firm when you're talking to other people about those things. So um, the, so I never was into, like you said, I really did follow my intuition with a lot of it. And for me, like keto was never something that was attractive to me because I, I was, I loved to eat carbs and I wasn't eating bad carbs and I was eating generally healthy. So I kind of was like, well, I don't need to be a stick. I don't need to be super skinny. And that seems to be keto is like mainly for losing weight. And at that point I was kind of just trying to be healthy and that just, for whatever reason, my intuition said, no, you need carbs. So even though I knew nothing about it really. So I did end up trying intermittent fasting and I'm trying to think of why I did that. It must have been the weight thing. And when I Mm -hmm. initially, you know what, you're the one I think who actually initially told me, why don't we try intermittent fasting? Cause you were trying it. You liked it at the time. It was starting to become a big fad and the science behind it does make sense. And there are, I think people that it works for. However, for me, it worked until it didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. So I started it. I, it took a really long time for me to get used to. So I stopped eating at eight. I didn't eat until I think even maybe a little earlier than 8 PM. And then I would, would not eat till noon the next day. It was convenient. Like it was amazing not to have to get up and make breakfast in the morning. Um, but I was drinking coffee on an empty stomach and then I was eating at noon. And then that also did help me to balance my meals a little bit better and be a lot more conscientious about the two meals I was eating. Cause I knew that I needed the nutrients. Um, so I did that for, I want to say like a year and a half and I got so thin and I was intermittent fasting and doing hit workouts three times a week. So it just took a toll on my body. I lo- I got down to like 110 pounds and I'm like 135 right now. So that was really thin for me. People were pointing out how thin I was. Some people in a positive way, some people a little bit worried. My chest bones were sticking out in pictures and looking back at like even this one specific picture I can think of, I was like, oh my gosh, it was so skinny. I can't even believe I fit into that dress. So for me, yes, I was happy to be thinner, but it was not um, sustainable. So then Mm -hmm. in the midst of like, I was really into intermittent fasting still. I, my realtor friend and I were driving and she's like trying to get pregnant. And she said, you know, I found this podcast and it's really interesting. These women, how they talk about women's health in particular. And I don't know how to explain it. And it doesn't make sense when I try to talk about it, but I think you should listen to it. I think you'll like it. And that was freely rooted podcast, which is Fallon and Corey. So God bless them. They really changed my life. And the way that they talked about, um, what they call pro metabolic eating, it's not a diet. It's just a way of eating is more women's health centric and fertility based. And so at this time in our lives, like we do, my husband and I do want to have a baby at some point soon. And so I was trying to I'm not trying to, but the mindset totally switched for me from let's be skinny to let's be healthy enough to have a baby one day. And that changed everything for me. And at the time I was off birth control and my periods were crazy and still irregular. And then after I started in this quote unquote pro metabolic world and diving more into women, menstruating women's health in particular, it, it, regulated my periods. The cramps aren't as bad. I have four day periods and then I have 28 to 35 day cycles. Like I haven't had any of that in my whole entire life until after about a year of eating consistently. So what that looks like is eating within 30 minutes of waking, not having coffee on an empty stomach. You focus on protein, fat, and carb on every meal. You eat meat, you eat organ, um, meats and like orange juice is not a sin (laughs) adrenal (laughs) cocktails which is like can be coconut water orange juice and salt so anyways all these just um basically nutrient dense foods meals and snacks 
eating enough, eating more. And so then I ended up gaining some weight, but at the same time, I started strength training around the, just around, I would say six months or eight months after I started uh, pro metabolic eating. So it really, those two types of lifestyles work really beautifully together and I gained good muscle. I look healthier, my periods regulated. And that's kind of what also <laughs> spurred me into a deeper journey of women's health, which we'll talk about. It's a little bit confusing and the deeper you go, the more confusing. And like you said, the more humbling it is that we really don't know <laughs> all that much. But my focus is for me at this time in my life, my cycle health and eating mm. for my cycle health. And I think as a menstruating woman, that is a really good thing to focus on as your fifth vital sign, as they say. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought up, you know, women's health and women's cycles specifically, because I mean, our bodies are completely different than men's. And what's really interesting, the re you know, you even said like, we don't know that much about it. We really don't because most of the science and nutrition studies that have been done have been done on men. And this is Which where, is you know, for the intermittent fasting. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And the the fasting piece is is so interesting. And this is where it really comes down to like if we don't have that much science on like how women respond to these things, like you really do have to try it in a way that you know is not harmful and then actually see and and track how your body responds because yeah. I also felt yeah, like you said, we kind of both went into the fasting experiment together and it, it worked until it didn't that is such yeah. a good way of putting it because a lot of these things that i tried along my way like did work at the beginning and then they didn't or then they made things worse and so then i like will shift would shift again and it's like this yo-yoing and like constantly yeah. trying something new which is so hard on your body and you know there's so many pieces that i want to touch on but let's talk about the fasting thing for a second because okay. The I think for women specifically, like take away all of the the biological factors, you know, the the menstruation, all of those that are super important. But if you even just look at like women alone and how we have been taught to think about our bodies, and you know, it's always about losing weight in order to feel worthy and beautiful and whatnot. And so women are already kind of in that mentality for the most part, working out as hard as they can, doing hit, which is just so exhausting on your body to do. Yeah all the time and then you add in fasting so it's like an it like really validates the oh i can eat less and mm -hmm. it's healthy for me this like yes. messed up mentality and it can be such a it can really do so much harm to your health because the problem is like when you when you shorten your feeding window now most women are eating even less calories even less oh, yeah. nutrition and it's like yeah, you might feel good for a little while, but like that over time with this intense exercise, with the stress, with all of the duties we take on as women already is insane. It's a lot. And so it doesn't mean that like intermittent fasting is absolutely off the table for everyone, including women. It just means that like we have to be even more cautious about how to, how we actually embark on fasting if that's something we really want to try. And yeah, just telling everyone on social media, like intermittent fasting is the best, like try this can be really dangerous because if yeah. women don't have that like greater understanding that like you have to get a certain amount of calories to even function, to even breathe, like your basal metabolic rate and all of that for it to work correctly, it's it's just a really tricky thing to talk about. And, and I definitely had to learn that the hard way. So oh, I'm glad that you mentioned it's... that. It is, it's so true. And I had to learn the hard way as well. And the reason you feel so good for a short amount of time is because, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, it's more for whoever's listening is cortisol is being released because that's going to be the energy source your body's pulling from because it doesn't have resources because we're depleting mm -hmm. it. So if you're doing, um, intermittent fasting and you're doing hit, hit is a very, very stressful thing on your body. I don't think that hit is inherently bad. I just think that it, women in particular do it a little bit too much. And like, even for me, my knees 
are permanently damaged from it and I don't I wouldn't be surprised if I had to do have a knee replacement later in life just because of doing hip for two years it sucks but there you go lesson learned um so you get this burst of cortisol and you feel really really good and then of course you lose weight because you inherently are cutting calories and that does work to lose weight but it's not necessarily a healthy way to lose weight and um after a while the the cortisol that's released in your body is going to start to affect your hormones and women are on a 30-day hormone cycle and men are on a 24-hour hormone cycle so our bodies react very very differently to intermittent fasting and so the fact that there are lots of studies on men in intermittent fasting and not on menstruating women is is problematic and menstruating women are often actually not in studies period haha pun intended because <laughs> there's so many other factors that play into a menstruating woman's bodies that they can't do a blind study on it basically mm -hmm. so i think for menopausal women i have listened to a few podcasts from reputable people that say intermittent fasting could be good for losing the um i forget what the type of fat is that builds up on your organs but also is it is it does it seem healthy for menopausal women because they don't have that vital sign to tell them that it's not healthy like when you're a menstruating woman and you're trying things you can look at your cycle and say does my cycle seem healthy and mm -hmm. including how how painful is it because people in america at least think that it's okay to have cramps during your period and it's not necessarily a good thing to have and that actually can be fixed um, mm -hmm. So, anyways, I'll get off my soapbox about that. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I keep just, going. That's what I yeah. I mean, I just think intermittent fasting has its benefits, but it's also really, really problematic in our culture right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's how your period and like that the health of your period and how you feel overall during like your cycle is very it's a very good indicator of how your health is as a woman. And so that's something that like, we just don't learn about. Like I never mm -hmm. learned about my period ever. And Either. you know, it like Western medicine, you know, has its place for sure. And I don't want this to be like, Oh, you know, Western medicine's <laughs> bad or the, or birth control. Cause it's, people are so black and white when it comes to nutrition and health. And it's like, there is so much more of a gray area that, yeah. You know, it needs to be taken into account, but like, yeah, just, I wish that we were educated more on how our cycles work and how to right. use them as like an indicator for like where you're at and what's working for you and what's not. Cause it's, it's such a huge part of our system and how we operate as women. And, you know, fertility is such a big thing that has gone down the drain really like yeah. for especially young women it's really sad and so obviously there's a lot of factors but like eating too little and working out too much like the whole eat less move more motto is <laughs> calories in calories out oh I dude know. it gets me fired up me <laughs> like but I, I think you and i like there's a lot of people coming into this space and i i'm just praying that we are the generation that teaches our children differently and that you and I, if nothing else, are going to teach our daughters about their cycle health. And I'm going to mm -hmm. have them read the fifth vital sign. You know, like they're going to be educated in that space and they're going to, they're not going to hear me talk about my body in an unhealthy way. They're not going to hear me talk about skinny or fat. And mm -hmm. so I know that's true for you too. Yeah, that's a good point to bring up. It's like a lot of these programs that we operate from unconsciously, especially as women, is generational, you know? Yeah. Like if we listened to our moms maybe make comments about their bodies and like not eating too much or whatever that are, you know, not meant to be harmful, but they are, especially when you're a kid and you're absorbing everything around you as like really – um black or white really like this is just how it is we don't have like that greater perspective to take things into context but it's like imagine how their parents were and it's yeah. just like we yeah it's generational trauma in some way around like f like food and our bodies and and health in general and it is really beautiful that like we are 
I think so too, that we are the generation that's going to start to shift that. And especially because we have the internet. So it's like, there's no lack of information, which can be good or bad, <laughs> yeah, but a little too much sometimes, right? <laughs> for sure. But like at the same time, like they can't stop us from sharing our stories anymore. Podcasts mm-hmm. like these, you know, so yeah. people are more aware, like even women like getting off birth control, which yeah. I'm grateful for because birth control is just a whole nother rabbit hole that we don't need to get into but it's just it can do a lot of damage to our natural cycles and so I think we should get into some of the lessons that we've learned I mean we've already kind of discussed some of them but let's talk about a few more that have come up for us that we've learned along the way because I know that we've learned a lot (laughs) and again these are our personal uh lessons that we've learned but other than fasting what have you and like doing too much of too many hit workouts and things like that what else have you taken away from your journey that you could share with others I have definitely been empowered to learn more about myself as a woman and I've learned that how different you know, menstruating premenopausal and menopausal bodies work and also for men. So I think just knowing where I'm at in my life and what works for me right now has been huge. And then also being able to learn about the signs that my body gives me, such as my basal body temperature and hair loss and stress and like your gut mind connection is a whole nother thing, which I know Lily are huge on. And, um, just, eating nourishing foods, learning about how bioavailable nourishment or nutrients work. So like, even though it's salads can be healthy for you, it's also like, you're not going to absorb as much nutrients from a piece of lettuce as you do from red meat and, and undemonizing, if that's a word, these things and just, oh my gosh, see, now my head's going like a million different directions because there's so much, but That's another thing is there's always more. And that's a big lesson I've had to learn. And you and I talked about this the other week was the more you dive into it, the more complicated it gets and the more questions I have rather than answers. So Mm -hmm. I think what I'm looking at now is what are the symptoms in my body that I, that are telling me something's wrong and how can I, what kind of, um, functional testing can I do to maybe uncover some of that and, what kind of nourishment healing my body with food can I do or what stressors can I take away to help me through this symptom and like get to the root cause of things rather than band-aiding it with medicine. Mm -hmm. And I've come a long way from the last couple of years because I used to be very, just because of how I was brought up, very into Western medicine, very trusting of doctors, very pro prescriptions. And now I'm like, I don't want to see a doctor. I want to do a home birth. Don't give me any medicine. Like, I don't want any of it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wow. way on the other side of what I, you know, was when I was 18. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is really interesting too. Cause even when I met you, yeah, I feel like there was a lot of that. And I mean, yep. no fault of your own. I mean, that's literally what we are fed from yep. the beginning. And so, and, and, you know, like, again, there's a place for the prescriptions. There's a place for the things, the interventions, but I think a big, okay, there's a lot of topics here to unpack. I want to for sure talk about the innate healing ability of our own bodies and like coming back to trusting our own bodies, especially as women. Like we are so intuitive. Like we really do know we just have never been taught to trust ourselves, to trust our bodies, to listen to the signs and the symptoms that are coming through and what they might be trying to tell us. And so let's, let's go there for a second and, um, just experience, like how, how did you start to trust your body again? And, you know, through the different things that you were trying, like, how did you start to, yeah, regain trust and like learn how to work with your body instead of against it? Definitely two things, experimentation and just knowledge, like taking, Mm -hmm. taking the power into my own hands to do my own research instead of relying on a doctor to tell me. And it's just, through listening to a lot of different podcasts and reading different books and what innately made sense to me, like eating enough (laughs) makes sense to me and 
and rather than starving yourself through intermittent fasting, if you will, mm-hmm. that's a little bit extreme, but you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. um, then experimentation. So, okay, I tried intermittent fasting. How did that make me feel? Then I tried eating breakfast before my workouts. How did that make me feel? How is this affecting my basal body temperature? How, how is my cycle reacting to things? And then also hearing other people's stories of healing is really helpful because I'm like, well, if she tried that and that worked for her, what if I try it and my symptom goes away? And then what if my symptom doesn't go away? Is there something Mm -hmm. else that's going on? So I think it's all experimental and I'm guessing that's the same for you. Is that true for you too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I am very fascinated about this and like this was like my life for so many years so that I I do did take it too far for sure in so many directions but mm-hmm. it did give me so much knowledge that I can now use to like help others which is really powerful but something I want to put out there that you kind of mentioned earlier too is the functional testing um, because this is something that I don't think people really know about not a lot of people know about I didn't know about this till like much later on in my journey but you know when you have a symptom like for me I had my all my issues really stemmed from my digestion and I had really bad bloating and just like horrible digestive issues starting in college and yeah, I went to so yeah and I went to so many doctors mainstream medical doctors and you know did all the tests and essentially the only kind of answer I got was you have IBS and they sent me home and that was it and I was like <laughs> okay like, well, what's what about- causing that <laughs> Exactly. That is the question. It's like, you just don't know. You just feel like you have no power. You know, it's like, okay, they, the doctor told me that that's all I know. Like I, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And that's kind of like what pushed me to like do more research and get answers. Cause I was like, this isn't helping me. Like, I don't know what to do with this. And so what I just want to say is that If you have the ability, cause it is expensive and it is a little bit trickier, but if you have Yeah, if you have the ability to go see a functional practitioner or a functional medical doctor, and I will leave a um, a website below called ifm.org that you can go check out to see if you can find someone in your area. But a lot of them do them virtually now. It is an out of pocket expense because our system is broken, in my opinion. Um, It's meant to treat, not prevent. Exactly, exactly. And so. It is an expense out of out of pocket, but what I'm going to say now is that if you have really specific symptoms that you're trying to deal with or like chronic disease or something like that, I the way that I see it now is like you either pay now for your health to like prevent something worse from happening or you're going to pay later when you're actually really sick and have to take care of it and there's no other choice. So it's like it is an investment in your health, but if it is at that point where you're like, I have this thing and I don't really understand it and I don't know how to treat it. You can go two ways. You know, you can go do all this research by yourself and try these things and and figure it out yourself. Or you can go to a, a doctor that isn't just a mainstream doctor, a doctor that wants to get to the root cause, which is what functional doctors do. And it will be a little bit more pricey because you have to do these extensive tests and things. But... I just, that is the thing that I wish I would have started with because I went the other direction of like, let me figure this out myself because I didn't even know that a functional medical doctor existed. And you can do more harm than good. Now, if your symptoms aren't that extreme, if you're just looking to lose some weight or like get rid of your fatigue or whatever, improve your metabolic health, then yeah, I don't think that that's always necessary. But it's just something to put out there because like I said, I just didn't have this information and I wish I would have because all of the crazy experimentation that I did to try to like fix myself made my symptoms so much more complicated and so much worse. And I just wasted so much money and time too. And it's like, it's just a rabbit hole that I want to hopefully help people prevent if they can. Yeah, it is quite a rabbit hole. I mean, there's just, and it's, and then you get into studies and how to look at research studies properly so you can Mm -hmm. make sure that they're they're blind and that's like a whole college course basically of how to read oh my gosh so (laughs) yeah that's Um, that's another good thing though to mention is like you know take every study you see in like especially headlines that you see people like repost and stuff with a grain of salt because first of all like 
it's clickbait. Like this is yeah. all an industry that comes down to money and they want to get your attention. They want you to try things to like invest your time and energy because that's how people make, that's how these companies make money ultimately. And if you don't really know how to understand the science and read the studies for yourself and understand like how they were conducted and whatnot, it can be really conflicting again. And nutrition studies are so difficult to understand and even to conduct because like mm -hmm. all of these different factors that play a role, you know, like what time you're eating, what are you eating? Where did it come from? How has it grown? Were you stressed? Yeah. Like, are you a woman? <laughs> like, I mean, it's endless. And so it's like, endless. how are you going to control all of those factors? It's really, really tricky. Yeah. So let's bring it down again to like basics. Cause I don't want to like overwhelm everyone <laughs> too much with too all late. this stuff. <laughs> I know, I know. But like the, the silver lining here is that we have gone through a lot of this so that we can now like maybe break it down a little bit easier and like give yeah. you just the basics of like what we've learned. And one thing that I want to mention, um, in regards to pro metabolic eating is like this really basic concept of nourishment over calories. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I sure can. Um, so when you're, when you are eating a pro metabolic diet, it's metabolism does not mean what I think the mainstream always, or you say, you know, you're skinny, so you have a fast metabolism and that's not how your metabolism actually works. And so it, it goes deeper in that sense, but it's, at least personally, I don't pay attention to how many calories I eat unless I'm thinking, did I get enough today? Mm. And it's not, it's not super strict. I think that tracking your macros for a, a certain amount of time can be beneficial just so you have an idea of how much protein, fat, and carb is in certain foods, but it's not necessary to do for a long time. You only have to track for like, I don't know, what would you say a month? And then you kind of get an mm -hmm. idea of like, okay, this amount of red meat gives me 40 grams of protein and you start to be able to balance your meals a little bit better. So then you start to understand how much bioavailability or bioavailable protein is in this steak. So if there's, it says there's 40 grams of protein, well, how much of that protein are you actually absorbing into your cells? And it, this focus shifts from calories to nutrient dense foods and you also start to learn what types of nutrients are in different types of foods so like you could say well don't eat a potato a white russet potato because all that is is empty carbs no it's not P potatoes are super high in potassium and especially as a woman you need a lot of potassium and most women aren't getting enough potassium so actually a white potato is very very beneficial for you and there's nothing wrong with eating some cooked broccoli, some potatoes, and some steak. <laughs> My favorite mm -hmm. meal, personally. So it's really interesting, um, just a mind shift into how much am I, how little should I be eating into, am I getting enough nutrients mm -hmm. in the day to balance? And then with that, for me, what the, the, the functional test that goes along with this nutrient um, density kind of outlook is your HTMA test, which is a hair tissue mineral analysis. You can Google it and do it online. There's different, like you said, virtual doctors and you cut a piece of your hair down at the kind of towards the nape of your neck and your hair gives you the last three months, more like a video than a snapshot of where your main mineral levels are. So pro metabolic again is about nutrients, but it's really about your foundational minerals because that's how your body functions. So it tells you your sodium, potassium, etc. cetera, um, ratios rather. So it tells you the levels, but uh, what more importantly are the ratios and they all interact with each other. And then it also gives you your heavy metal loads. So like, for instance, I'm kind of high in my aluminum and that's preventing my cells from being able to grab on to other things. So I had, um, high calcium and high potassium, no high calcium and high magnesium in my hair, which means my body or my cell is not absorbing it. It's distributing it into my hair. So that is a really cool test. However, you have to work with somebody who can explain it to you and who can help you um, figure out what types of foods or sometimes supplementation that you need to balance out your ratios. Um, someone else I know did it at the same time as me and her, her levels were really low and I've always, you know, maybe 
I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. There's a lot of actually different factors for her, but maybe that means she's not getting enough nutrients in those areas. So maybe she needs to up it or maybe she needs to supplement it. So the doctor, functional doctor can help her and me decide what direction to go with that. And like for me, she wanted to, she wanted me to get a bunch of supplements, which is not my vibe. Like I will take some supplements, but I don't love them. So I'm trying currently to figure out on my own how to uh, get those mineral levels up using food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a food first approach is is a great little like tidbit to think about because food should be able to give you a lot of what you need in terms of nutrition um, and minerals and such. But then again, like our soils are very depleted and there's all that whole conversation. So it's like sometimes supplementation... Exactly. Sometimes supplementation is absolutely beneficial. And um, as long as you're getting it from a a quality source, I think that that can be really helpful for some people um, in today's day and age. But I do love that you mentioned that test. I think that that's a good one to for people to like start with even and and look into one that's actually uh, like that's something to invest your time and energy into versus something like a food sensitivity test, in my opinion. Yes. Because those only, can be a little bit tricky. Bucks. Yeah. God. Which one? The HTMA tests are only oh, really? 100 bucks. Yeah, it's pretty cheap as far as that goes. And then mm-hmm. instead of experimenting with supplements, which I've done and you've done, and to be honest, like I never saw any results from it because it is more like you'll you'll be able to see better results in something like an htma test when you go to retest later but instead of wasting all your money buying hundreds of dollars of supplements because supplements are super expensive you can actually get a snapshot of what you need to work Mm -hmm. on for sure there's no guessing there this is what your ratios are let's supplement in this way and then you are spending your money knowing that it's most likely going to help you and and give Mm -hmm. you some results. And then you retest your HTMA three months later after you've been taking the supplements and also whatever advice they give you around types of food to eat. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So again, it's testing instead of just guessing if you have the ability (laughs) to do that. But yeah, I mean, the nourishment piece is, I just, I like to break it down that way because we've been so, again, like brainwashed to think that calories is all that matters. And it's like, your body does not know what a calorie is. Like at the end of the day, like food is information. I know. And it's like, it it can be helpful sometimes. Like, like if you're tracking, whatever it, there's room for it. But again, if we focus on like how much nourishment am I getting from a food that is so much better for your overall health. And you know, there's so many ways of looking into that, but one really simple tactic that's like mostly works across the board is like, if a food has a, a, a lot of color, like a deep color, that can be a good sign. Like red meat, you know, it's been so demonized, but like red meat has an incredible source of nutrition and yeah. it's very bioavailable, very absorbable thing. You know, it, it's just like good colors. That can be a really simple way of breaking it down, but there's more to it than that. But just a right. simple little tip. Um, Now let's get into a piece that we kind of mentioned earlier that I love to talk about now because it's been such a big part of my journey, but it's the stress piece, really. Um, Mind-body connection is, I mean, your mind and body are really one. It's one and the same. They're communicating with each other all the time. And one piece that I just like scream from the rooftops now is that your body can't heal when it's stressed. It just no. can't. And like, mm-hmm. that is the vicious cycle I was trapped in. Like I was convinced that my answers that I was looking for to heal my body were in the physical, right? In the diet and lifestyle piece, like either a new diet or a new workout routine or a new supplement or whatever. And I was doing that. And every time it didn't fully fix me, quote unquote, I would try something else. And so I got into this like stressful state where I was like desperate to find answers and like get like berating myself for like not trying thinking that it was my fault essentially because it wasn't working and so Mm -hmm. finally it got to like a breaking point where I really had like exhausted all my resources and I was so tired and my functional medical doctor was like hey Lily like I think that you should maybe try addressing this psychologically and I was like wow okay like and I was I mean I know I was like a slap in the face but I needed it I needed it because I wasn't understanding it like I knew the power of the mind and I was meditating already like I was doing the things but I wasn't connecting the dots and 
something I just want to point out there is like whether that is hit exercises that you're doing every single day or whether you are fasting a ton or whether you are restricting your food or whether you are just really stressed at work. These are all forms of stress. And our bodies are designed to handle a little bit of stress. Stress isn't inherently bad, but it's like when we start stacking these stressors, it absolutely puts your body into a fight or flight state from which you can't heal. So what's your relationship to stress? What is your opinion on all of this or your experience? So I am generally not a stressed person, but again, I can, when I do go through periods of stressfulness, typically in my job, because real estate, it it can be very stressful depending on who you're working with. And if you have um, money coming in or not, right? Like it's it's commission based. It can be very up and down. So that's a big stressor. So when I'm going through states of stress, it does show up in my cycle. I have worse cramps. I like various different symptoms in my period or I ovulate late or I don't ovulate, you know, things like that. So again, being able to recognize what's normal for you in your cycles can help you detect that something is going wrong under the surface. And even if you don't realize how stressed Mm -hmm. you are, your body's going to tell you. So I think I am lucky in the fact that I um, don't have a lot of inherent stress in my life and I do deal with stress well, but I also attribute that to the way that we nourish our bodies. It helps you react to stressors a lot better. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of all I have to say about that. You could probably more go into more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that that's a good thing to point out, even just that your body will tell you, you know, when you are stressed. And oftentimes we see that as like, oh, like just annoyed that our body is is showing us another symptom. We're like, oh, now I need to deal with that. Or maybe it's because I'm doing this. And it's like, whoa, maybe just like slow down and see if there's something deeper going on. If you need like look at your lifestyle and, and your mindset these past few weeks and how have you been like, have you been on this constant like adrenaline rush? Like, let's get shit done mm-hmm. mindset. You know, that could be a part of it. But I think that before we move on to some of the rapid fire questions, it would be probably beneficial to leave people with a couple of practical tips because I realize Mm. that we've been jumping all around here and I'm sorry about Mm. that, but you know, it was, it was going to be a conversation like that and I'm, I'm cool with it, but, um, maybe some practical tips about pro metabolic. So, and you know, you mentioned it a little bit about what pro metabolic Mm. is. It's really a lifestyle. It's a way of eating that supports your metabolism at a cellular level. Right. And so it does focus on, on nourishment over calories. It focuses a lot on like, you know, understanding your cycle and using the different clues that your body gives you to maintain your health. Mm-hmm. And so what are some of the, like the, the tools within that, that you use or have used that have helped you with your pro metabolic way of, of eating and living? Like, do you yeah. track your, your basal metabolic rate every morning and things like I that? Do. Yeah, okay. I do. I started tracking my basal body temperature because I got, well, I was, I was off of birth control for a while. Um, and obviously there's other forms of contraception there, but I wanted to track my basal body temperature because I started to read about the fertility awareness method. And that was another, that's, that journey started at the same time as the pro metabolic journey. And it definitely all relates to each other. Your temperatures can also tell you a lot. A lot about your body which is really interesting we don't get into that right now but if you have not looked into fertility awareness method or fam I would highly recommend doing that um, so I track my BBT basal body temperature with the temp drop you're supposed to do it orally for like the best results but I've done both ways and for me they're pretty similar so I just do temp drop which is an armband um, and then what was your I forget what your question was just like practical tips oh. for like pro metabolic. Oh right, right, right. So yeah, BBT and then um, anything. And they, this is what I was gonna say. Go ahead. They can do that with just a regular thermometer, right? Yeah. Like so just oral temp every morning the, before you get out of bed, tracking that. Yeah, the, it's it can be really tricky if you're not waking up around the same time every day. If you have a baby or children or. Um, you also like you're supposed to warm it up under your tongue for 10 or for like a minute or more 
actually, I think it's like 10 minutes. It was a while ago. So I'm trying to remember, but I would like literally fall back asleep because you couldn't Mm -hmm. get out of bed. So it just allowed me to go back to sleep with it in my mouth and everything. So there's some tricks with that, but that's why I switched to using temp drop, but I would recommend just doing oral first and then Mm -hmm. a temp drops like a hundred and something bucks. So it's a little bit of an investment tool there. Um, so anything that causes stress on your body is what we're trying to avoid back to what you were saying is that is really the foundational, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like perspective in pro metabolic Mm -hmm. and your metabolism is a stressor indicator. So if you do your HTMA test, it tells you what type, what stress state your metabolism is in, which is really interesting. Um, so like for instance, tip number one, don't have coffee on an empty stomach. This is a huge stressor on the body, male or female, and it releases, you're already releasing cortisol. That's how you wake up. And then you're not eating, which is more cortisol. And then you're adding caffeine, which is more cortisol. And it's also really hard on your digestive system. So even though it feels good to wake up and have a glass or a cup of coffee, you definitely want to get some breakfast in first or at least with your coffee. That would be my first tip. Mm-hmm. Um, my second tip would be for 99% of people to drink an adrenal cocktail every day and see how that makes you feel after a couple of weeks. An adrenal cocktail is, it's a drink that you can make for your adrenals. Almost I would, a lot of people's adrenals are stressed. I definitely have stressed adrenals. I don't even know why, but I do. And, um, that would be a form of whole food, vitamin C, potassium, and sodium. So those all play in with each other and getting all of those in, at the same time is going to be really beneficial for your adrenals. So I do fresh squeezed orange juice, uh, coconut water is a potassium source, and then just some sea salt. I used to do like orange juice, raw milk, maple syrup, cream of tartar, which is potassium, some salt, and it was like a 50-50 bar, but a drink, and it was really good, but I got tired of it. So anyways, there's a lot of different ways. You could do inner leaf aloe vera juice. Um, so there's lots of... Um, posts on Instagram for various people that I follow to see what kind of adrenal cocktails are out there to make. Mm -hmm. And then the other main tip would be balancing every meal. So you want to get a protein, fat, and carb with every single meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. And like touching on fats too, it's like women have been so afraid to eat fat and that's a whole another myth. I think that is not doing us much good because we need healthy fats in our diet. And so um, just don't be afraid of fats, but like, of course, do your own research and don't drink it from a straw would be my opinion because I have done the (laughs) keto thing. And although I don't think I was doing it in a way that was like some people going to like McDonald's and just getting like just the most (laughs) horrifying types of fats, um, it's still like – yeah. Keto is like, in my opinion, just a therapeutic modality now, like for people with like epilepsy or like serious mental, con- or like uh, brain disorders or things like that, that can use it from like, or if you really want to lose weight, like there's kind of extremes that you can use it for a little while. But like point is have some fat in like a good amount with your meals to balance things out. Um, and you know, this way of eating is just like, it's very natural in my opinion it's back to like basics back to like focusing on nutrition back to feeling good in your body making sure that your body is optimally functioning and not just like oh i'm just losing weight like we want to get to a point where like we're focusing on symptoms like you know how is your how are your energy levels how is your sleep um you know, is your hair falling out? I like, hopefully not, but these are, you can look up Google, uh, um, signs of metabolic dysfunction and you can find a whole bunch of really common, really common, but not normal signs of, uh, metabolic dysfunction that can help you see if that's something you want to, you want to work on. But I appreciate you giving those tips because I think that, I mean, those are simple things that anyone can do. Um, again, keep, and I, I would just add in there, maybe like keep a journal. I love like tracking food and mood journals at the beginning of anyone's, um, journey and just, just to see the patterns within, within your own body, because you're, again, your body will tell you how something is working and how it's not if you start to trust it and like listen to it. So those are some amazing tips and, um, hopefully that helps some people out there. You can always reach out to Kelsey and I to just chat more if you want to, but 
one more question that I have um, before we move to the rapid fire questions. We're already almost approaching an hour, so I know. this has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to respect your time, but if you had one piece of advice for the Kelsey that you were, I don't know, maybe four years ago or when you started this whole journey, whatever that is, what would you say to her now with the perspective that you have? Oh my gosh. Loaded question, Lily. <laughs> no pressure. What would I, I know. What would I say to Kelsey <laughs> four years ago? Okay. So four years ago I was 24. Um, I would say listen to your intuition and I just really wish I would have learned how to read my body a long time ago and like just being empowered as a woman and the sacredness that our bodies hold and becoming attuned with it and listening to it and your, and your intuition, like your innate ability to just be human and be a woman that's that's what I always go back to in any diet fad that I read about. I'm like, well, is this how did we get here as a woman? Like, how did we how did we get here from the time that we discovered fire? You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. from eating keto. I'll tell you that much. So <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what I go back to is just that I feel like I just I want to be and I am a very intuitive human and I think everybody can kind of tune into that portion of themselves Mm -hmm. beautiful I mean (laughs) just to add it in there this podcast is called home to self so it's like kind of something I like to talk about (laughs) exactly well that's the thing is you and I have always really aligned in that Mm -hmm. in our in our values and the way that we see the world so I think that it's perfect it's a perfect title Oh, thank you. Yeah, I agree. It has so many meanings, but it's like when it comes to health, like I could not agree more, like trust yourself, like come back to your body, like think about, you know, how did we get here? Like, that's such a good question to reflect on. Like, yeah, we weren't made in a lab. Like we, we, we are part of nature. How did we get here? Like, think about it. People, we didn't have these health epidemics back in the day. Like people were way more connected to their food, connected to their bodies. They didn't have google to like tell them what's wrong with them they had to listen you know to their signs and their bodies and so it's going back to that in a sense so all right final few questions just some some rapid fires probably like three three ish four top three health practices whether that's Um, physical mental emotional whatever um okay health practices i would say um, like the pro metabolic eating as a whole, just that whole way of looking at food and nourishment, strength training safely. Like don't just get out there and throw your back out, like actually have somebody guiding you into how to properly lift and, and don't lift too heavy for your, you know, just li- again, listen to your body when you're doing those things. And then a morning routine whatever that looks Mm. like for you, sticking to a really solid morning routine, setting yourself up for success every day, hopefully getting into the gym, you know, early in the day. So you don't have that stressor later. So yeah, I love, I love my mornings. Perfect. Me too. I love my mornings so much. Who have been some of your role models, teachers, mentors, whatever that you have learned from about Um, health, about health, you for sure. So thanks for all the information you put out there. And um, so my number one, I would say, go-to is Amanda Montalvo, which is Healing Hormone RD on Instagram. And she has the podcast, Are You Menstrual? She has, she's like just the the go-to for me for everything. I've listened to a lot of her podcast episodes multiple, multiple times. And she's unlocked a whole, the whole metabolic and fertility space for me and then lately innate fertility on instagram um i'm blanking on her name right now because i just know people by their instagram names but she also has a new podcast and she she's so she, her whole thing is talking about preconception and preparing your body for conception and birth and um she's unlocked a lot of more fertility specific nutrition pre during post and then the home birth space and and just all that all that 
woo woo off the charts like people don't really think about it as much kind of conception world <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah have you heard of lily nichols yeah i think that's love her, her follow okay. her she's great yeah. too kale me okay. nutrition gosh there's mm-hmm. so many good mm-hmm. pro metabolic nutritionists on instagram that you can get so much information from yeah and even if you're not trying to get pregnant like having a healthy cycle which is a step to be fertile and be able to get pregnant safely and healthy you know it's just so important to make sure that as a woman that you are menstruating correctly and that your that your cycle is healthy is healthy <laughs> great yeah. great yeah you know just you don't healthy. you don't want to have pain during your cycle no that's, something that's I'm not normal on. do you want to know mm-hmm. the next um the next embarkment i'm doing for my health yeah <laughs> health experimentation it's always something um, I know. recently it was the htma and now i'm on to the next thing which is vaginal steaming what so is that listening, i'm sorry that you have to hear <laughs> about this oh they my probably gosh. already left a while ago they probably left. wait but yeah i i there's few things i haven't heard of and this is one of them so please oh, yeah. enlighten me Oh yeah. So I started (laughs) acupuncture. It's all within kind of this Chinese medicine space, which I also love. And so vaginal steaming, I learned about from the, um, are you menstrual podcast? And she had kit from Katara's Katara love is her website, Mm kataralove.com. And she had her on the podcast about vaginal steaming and all the benefits of it. So I had my husband make me a box that you sit on because she sells them, but they're like $300. I'm like, Dylan, you can just make this for me, right? And he's like, yeah. So he made it and it has like a hole, like a long hole on top. So you, I even have the steam pot, right? Not that one. You can't see it. It's clear (laughs) right there. I haven't done it yet because I, I can't for a few more days, but you steam, you have these herbs that I bought from her website. You don't even have to do it with any herbs and you sit on the box kind of spread Eagle and it steams. And so basically it's to, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of benefits, but it's to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like release any stagnation so it can actually help with if you have infections or something like that that's one realm of it another is to prevent like help with menstrual cramps so that's the main reason i'm doing it and that's because your menstrual cramps are trying to that it is trying to release stagnation so this is supposed to support that and then also if you're so you can't do it while you're pregnant because it's just it's loosening everything in there you don't want yourself loose during pregnancy But when you're ready to go into labor, like 37 weeks plus, Mm. you can prepare for labor by vaginal steaming. And it not only helps to induce labor, but it makes labor a little bit easier. Your cervix opens up, like all that good stuff. So that was the main reason why it sparked my interest because I want to prepare for that. But then it does have all these other benefits too. So highly recommend that episode, Kit from Katara episode on on, um, Are You Menstrual? I love so that. That's goes. so interesting. Yeah, please do. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I thought it didn't get more weird than like coffee enemas, but here we are. Okay, steaming. so that's something <laughs> I'm not going to embark on, I don't think. But I, All right. I, it's interesting. It's... I just wish there was a different way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's no getting around the the actual, yeah. what's actually happening. But yeah. I've I've been there, done that. I mean, it definitely has a lot of healing benefits to it but yeah it's not something i want to do all the time not very fun but anyway (laughs) there you go (laughs) some fun tips for you guys to add to your add to your experimentation um all right you answered my next question which was about some of your favorite podcasts um yeah do you have any others yeah if you're interested in getting to know what the pro metabolic space looks like i'd really recommend freely freely rooted and when you go to listen to these podcasts go to the very first episode scroll all the way the heck down there because they're gonna Mm -hmm. set some really strong foundations for you and then build off of that so freely rooted um and are you menstrual uh there's one i think it's called the fifth vital sign if you're interested in learning about the fertility awareness method and I have your podcast on here home to sell oh, oh fertility Friday for fertility oh. awareness method but it's by Lisa I forget her not last name and she wrote the fifth vital sign she's kind of like one of the um the what's the word entrepreneurs or whatever of that space 
Mm-hmm. And what was the other one I was trying to think of? Oh, healing hormones. So healing hormones is also kind of fertility awareness method based, but she brings in a lot of pro metabolic aspects and also guests on there. So all those are really good, and they're both on Apple and on um, Spotify. Spotify. Perfect. That's so exciting. I you've, There's some that I haven't heard of either, so that's that's exciting. I always love new podcasts. I'm like, that's how I've learned so much. So yes, me that's too. really good. Thank you for sharing those. Okay. All right, perfect. I have one final question for you, which you okay. we tapped into a little bit, but like what does coming home to yourself mean to you? Oh. Um, interesting okay that excuse me I think that you know it has so many different aspects so definitely being intuitive and 100% especially as a woman learning to read your body cannot express that enough I think that is truly what that means to me but you know last weekend I got my birth chart read and that was a whole other perspective of being myself and it was kind of it's things you already know about yourself but seeing it in the stars and having somebody just reading your chart this person doesn't even know you and they're telling you stuff that you already knew about yourself is really really empowering so like hearing this other person say hey you're magnetic you're powerful and you're a great manifester I'm like well I already knew that stuff but not really and so now that gave me permission to just, um, I guess, express that more, hold on to it, and really make it a part of who I am. So that was really interesting. And again, with the intuitive, like intuitively, mm-hmm. you know these things about yourself. And so how can you make it, how can you believe that it's solely, like, true within yourself enough that you're comfortable expressing it and following that path, if that makes sense beautiful I, I love it there's so many tools we can use to like learn more about ourselves but ultimately it's just you it, it's validating for what you already kind of knew and so mm-hmm. all these pieces really help you to own who you are and use yeah. use your gifts for good so thank you so much kelsey this has been so much fun how know, can people really <laughs> Yay. How can people connect with you, whether that's for real estate or just to chat more about any of this, share share your Instagram handle and such. Yeah. So if you want to put it below, you can. It's at keys from Kelsey because it's almost solely real estate content. I do put other stuff on my stories and a little bit of personal stuff too, but definitely here to answer any real estate questions anybody has or do like a consultation. Even if you're not in my area, I'm happy to talk about it. And I'm super active on Instagram. So that's definitely the best way to find me. If you message me, I will see it and I will respond. So, mm-hmm. there you yeah. Go. Beautiful. And then what's your podcast name for real estate? Oh yeah. So it's real talk because we couldn't really think of anything more creative than that. But if you type in real talk, it should pop up. There's quite a few podcasts called real talk. Maybe I'll have you link it. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's a picture of me and a picture of my team lead Brandy on there. So you can kind of see. Perfect. Yeah. And then the, they can access that too, through your Instagram, but I'll include everything in the show notes below. Um, yeah, definitely go check her out for, like I said, you make real estate, like kind of fun. I'm like, what, (laughs) (laughs) what is this? Learn a little something and I embarrass myself and yeah, it's all good. (laughs) I do. I do too. That's for sure. So. Thank you so much. It's been so fun to like grow and learn alongside you and like just have a friend who like gets it and understands and like feels similar and to bounce ideas off of because this journey can be very, it can get very lonely and it can be very just like confusing and just to have someone like to talk to is, is really powerful. So I appreciate everything that you do. Thanks for coming on and sharing your, your journey with us. And yeah, I think that's all. Yay. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Bye, everyone.